Go to Ephesians chapter 1, please. Nice. Ephesians chapter 1. Nice. <clears throat> so I think what would work out as a very good balance for the church is that I'm going to rotate books with Pauline epistles with uh, doctrinal books. I think that will work out as a good balance from time to time. I feel like if we kept going into doctrinal books and we'll forget our church age doctrinal foundations. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if we keep going in church age doctrinal foundations, you all starve to death. So, because you want to know more deep doctrinal things. All right, let's go to Ephesians chapter one, please. And we'll read verse one. All right. Now, uh, an introduction to the book of Ephesians. And this is found that if you have your Ruckman reference Bible, he'll mention this in the introduction. So then this book was written after the timeline of Galatians and Romans, so approximately around 62 A.D. So this was written to the city of Ephesus that time. So the city of Ephesus that time, they received their epistle around 62 A.D. If you know your Bible, the city of Ephesus, it was known for its uh, goddess Diana, which is Semiramis, obviously. The, uh, the Ephesians, the church of Ephesus, was also known for its great zeal. And then you'll notice mostly positive commentary throughout the book of Ephesians. It's apparent from Revelation chapter 2, when you look at that book, that it was a, a church that was notable for its zeal for the Lord. <coughs> It was written to Ephesus. It is called a prison epistle, the book of Ephesians. The reason why it is called a prison epistle is because the Apostle Paul, he was writing it in prison. This was one of the epistles that he wrote while he was in prison. If you know your Bible, the Apostle Paul, he was uh, stuck in prison that time. And then during the time where he was stuck in prison, he would write the book of Ephesians that time. Okay, this is not going to work out well. Okay. All right. <laughs> We're not playing Pictionary now. Okay. <laughs> All right, so another thing about the book of Ephesians... <clears throat> is that uh, Paul wrote it during his first imprisonment at Rome. Ephesians has six chapters, 155 verses, and 3,022 words. The book of Ephesians would have six chapters, <clears throat> 155 verses, and 3,022 words. Some other things about the book of Ephesians. Paul wrote it in prison. The first two jap chapters, Dr. Upman says, Jesus Christ is chosen and exalted geographically as well as spiritually because he is above all principalities and powers in the universe. The death of Christ makes a joint body possible between saved Jews and Gentiles. In the next two chapters, we learned that our unity was a mystery unknown until Paul's conversion. Although the church can be found in type, in Eve, Ruth, Rebecca, and others in the New Old Testament. As a doctrinal subject, this mystery was unknown until it was revealed to Paul. We also learned that God has a plan with a purpose in it. This is carried out by his distribution of gifts to ministers and the commands to live a superior life. In the last two chapters, our walk and warfare are described with specific instructions on conduct. Then there are specific orders for children and servants, descriptions about our enemies and armament, and finally the close and benediction. Okay, so as you might know, basically it goes uh, in this following manner, is that the first two chapters, as you might know, is exalting Jesus Christ. And then chapters 3 through 4 
would be about the mystery of the church. And this one we're going to get into some interesting dispensational topics. There is no doubt that dispensationalism is true. Amen. For some of you who are still unfamiliar with dispensationalism, it should be a basic thing by now. Dispensationalism is God's method, historical grammatical method, in dividing verses to the right group of people and right time period. Because if you combine all the verses together and think they're all applied to you, you're going to come up with major heresy and error in your doctrine. So it's important that you divide the verse that, hey, this is not applying to me. This is toward a Jew in the timeline of the tribulation, for example. So it is very important that you understand dispensationalism. If you're still unfamiliar with that, I would highly recommend to please watch our video, Amazing Dispensational Truth from Genesis through Revelation. Please watch that video. We also have a dispensationalism playlist. And then it'll teach you all the important things on dispensationalism. Yeah. Chapter 5 through 6 would be discussing about our Christian walk and our Christian warfare, which is given specifics on what to do to succeed in warfare and in our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, anyway, so um, as we come over here, to the prison epistles. Let's cover a few things <clears throat> that we should be aware about in our Bible when we talk about the prison epistles. All right, the first part is at verse 1. We're going to look at verse 1 in our main text. We're going to look at verse 1 in our main text. The Bible says over here, Paul, that's himself, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So Paul's introducing himself as the writer. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. By the will of God. So notice that it was God's will for Paul to be an apostle. People who say that uh, the apostle Paul, that uh, he is not a legitimate apostle, uh, they can soak their head in a bucket. Yeah. The reason why is because it was God's will for Paul to be an apostle. Did you notice that right over there? Mm -hmm. It is God's will for Paul to be an apostle. Now, uh, we're going to look at James chapter 4, please. Go to James chapter 4. We're going to go to the book of James, chapter 4, please. Now, when God called a, the apostle Paul to be an apostle, you have to understand over here that it was his will, and it's a direct will of God. That is very different from the permissive will of God. You might say, what is the permissive will of God? So basically the idea is this, is that the permissive will of God is that basically he'll allow you to do it. You have his permission, but that's something that's not something that he would approve of or he would like. Sometimes there are these parents, right? They would allow the child to do something. Why? Because the parent loves the child, but they, that doesn't necessarily mean they approve of it. So when Paul was called to be an apostle, it was under the direct will of God. It wasn't a permissive will of God like how we live every day. So you got to realize everything that you're doing today is under the permissive will of God. But how many of you are living according to his direct will? Mm, That's important. Nothing goes outside of his will, you got to understand. Everything that God does, he has a purpose behind it. But there are, but that doesn't mean that he approves of everything that goes on. All right, so let's look at James chapter 4. This is an example of a, the permissive will. Notice that everything that we can do, but it's according to God's will. That's why we're able to eat and drink and do all kinds of things. All right, we're going to read at verse 13. Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow. We will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. So see, that sounds like you, typical everyday you, what you want, how you live and want to do things. But notice that at verse 15, that you can't just simply think that tomorrow that you'll be able to go shopping, you'll be able to do that. Because verse 14 shows, verse 14, that you could die. 
You could die tomorrow. So just because you say, hey, we're all going to go shopping tomorrow, you got to realize you might not live tomorrow. That's why it's quite a habit. You're going to hear a lot of the brethren saying, Lord willing, yeah, Lord willing, see you tomorrow, or Lord willing, we'll go shopping tomorrow, etc., etc. That's why at verse 15, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So notice over here that these people are able to do shopping, buy, sell, and do whatever they want. But doing this and doing that in their lives is going to be according to God's will. It won't escape that fact. Everything you do is according to his permissive will. But I wonder how many times you live directly according to his will, right? So Paul, he was called under the direct will of God. All right, let's go back to our main text. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1 and continue reading verse 1 over here. The Bible says, um, so we already saw the first half of verse 1. Paul's an apostle of Jesus Christ according to God's direct will, to the saints which are at Ephesus. So the author Paul is addressing to saints which are at Ephesus, those who are, say, believers, and to the faithful <clears throat> in Christ Jesus. So the people who are saved, they're called saints, and they're also considered to be the faithful as well. Verse 2, grace be to you. So Paul, you'll notice that throughout uh, a lot of Pauline epistles, he'll always give that address. So that's important to understand. How you can tell the author is going to be Pauline or Paul is because of that address. Grace be to you and peace. So keep that in mind. All right. That's going to be very useful in the future, especially when people debate about the book of Hebrews. Who's it written by? The reason why there's a strong contention for Paul is because of that address at the last chapter, the way that his style is written out. So, Paul says that the saints, that he bids them grace and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's given from God our Father and also from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this grace, look at Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 4. This grace is not talking about salvation here because Paul addresses them as if they're already saved. He called them already saints, right? He also already called them faithful, right? So this grace that he bids to them is not salvation here. A lot of times when people see the word grace, they automatically think salvation. No, that's not true. So a lot of people see a text, for example, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Oh, Noah got saved at Genesis. No, he was saved long before that, actually. It didn't mean that he just got saved when, he, uh, when God granted him grace, uh, when uh, God found grace in him, etc. So a lot of people, uh, you can't be an amateur about that. So the word grace, you got to understand, is basically something that uh, we don't deserve, yet we receive it. That's a simple idea. And this can apply to what? Salvation. See? We don't deserve to be saved, yet we gain it. That's why we quite often use grace for salvation. Why? Because that is truly the case in our salvation. We don't deserve heaven. We don't deserve to be free from sin. But God gave it to us anyway. So, in salvation, and then let's see... How it happens in our daily life is Hebrews 4. This is a great verse, all right, about God's grace. An example of God's grace or a definition would be Hebrews 4 more than Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, to be honest. Because remember, grace is not salvation here. <clears throat> Look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace, to help in time of need. There you go. So notice over here that God's throne is described as grace. Why? Because there's something that we can beseech and receive before his throne. A benefit. Notice that it is a granting re to your request at verse 16. Find grace to help in time of need. There's something that you're going through that you're struggling with or a time of need. And then God gives you help 
at that moment. So that's an example of his grace. His grace is something that he gives to you during your time of needs. So extra strength, extra help, extra support in some way, but that's considered to be his grace. So let's look at the book of 2 Corinthians 12. This is a great example of that one. So we Christians need his grace every day, you got to understand. We receive salvation by grace, but I'm, I'm not content to just stop over there. I need his grace daily, and I don't know about you. If you think that you can live without his grace, then you're dead wrong, my friend. No one can survive without his grace. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, a fine example of that. You'll notice that... Uh, Paul, that he was struggling with something at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So Paul received this tremendous beating from a messenger of Satan. So what does he need? Look at verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, there's something that you need more than healing. You see that? That's important. At verse 9, something that's better than God healing you from the infirmity that the messenger of Satan gives to you is actually his grace. Yes. Lord, take away this problem. Yes. Actually, what's better than that is him giving you his grace to go through the problem. Can you imagine that? So His grace is sufficient for you. It's that powerful. So if there's something, if God gave you an option, would you prefer my grace or would you prefer the problem to be taken away? I'm going to be very honest with you. What you should say is I prefer your grace more than you eliminating the problem. If you have a preference. Now of course that doesn't mean don't stop praying for the Lord to get rid of your problem. Paul, he did that. He realized it wasn't a sin, and then he requested the Lord. Many times we serve a mighty God who answers prayer. But you got to realize that his grace that he gives to you, whatever it may be, is more valuable than any elimination of any problem you can think of. All right. After all, it was his ultimate grace that got us out of hell to begin with. 